We are exploring beautiful vignettes, indoor plant paradises, and the healing power of music. Hello everybody, I'm Amy Gutierrez, back to host the second segment of Sonoma County Women in Conversation at Home. Our goal is to inspire and empower by highlighting topics of interest and importance to women in particular. This episode focuses on bringing joy, love, and light into our homes to help us thrive. For the past five years, Summit State Bank has helped introduce us to many diverse and amazing women. Their own personal stories have entertained us, moved us, and inspired us. On behalf of the staff of the Press Democrat and Summit State Bank, thank you for joining us. I wanna take a moment to thank those that have made this night's feature possible, presenting sponsor Summit State Bank and founding sponsor St. Joseph Health. These two organizations have supported women in conversation from the very beginning. Their consistent and collaborative participation has helped to develop and evolve the program and their financial support has been vital to its continuation. We also send out a big thank you to supporting sponsors, North Coast Tile and Stone, Encore Events, Montgomery Village and Cambria Estate Winery. Please support these businesses as they have so graciously supported this series and made this special evening possible. So tonight we will explore the art of creating space to think, live, and breathe for both yourself and those around you. We'll discuss honoring physical and mental space with three inspiring local women who have transformed their environment through design, nature, and music. Before we talk to our speakers, let's tune in to Eat the Season with Heather Irwin from Sonoma Magazine's Bike Club and Live La Dolce Vita with Sophia England from Sonoma Magazine. Plus, we so enjoyed Dusky Estes in part one. She will be returning with a fun segment on seasonal cocktails. I am Sophia Englund, and I'm the digital editor of Sonoma Magazine. Last year at this time, I was traveling in Italy. It won't be possible to return to Italy for a while, but that doesn't mean it's not possible to be inspired by the Italian way of life. When I think of Italy, I dream of La Dolce Vita. For me, La Dolce Vita is about living in the moment and being open to all that life has to offer. It's about enjoying small luxuries, good food, good wine, beautiful things, time with family and friends, the time to do nothing. So how can you live La Dolce Vita? Mangia, mangia. For Italians, eating is about so much more than just satisfying your hunger. Food is passion, tradition, and joy. It's a ritual that brings people together. What I like about Italian cuisine is that it usually relies on making the most of what you've got. It all comes down to the ingredients. What's in season? What's fresh? Where is it grown? It's about enjoying the process, selecting the ingredients from a farmer's market or your own home garden, preparing the meal, setting the table, and then enjoying the food with people you love. What would you do if you didn't have to do anything? No to-do lists, no after-hour work tasks, no distractions. If you had nothing you felt you had to do, at least for a few minutes, you might just begin to enjoy il dolce far niente, the sweetness of doing nothing. The Italians have built in all kinds of ways of appreciating life's little joys every day. At the beginning of the day, it could be saving an espresso or a cappuccino in a cafe. In the middle of the day, it could be enjoying a long leisurely lunch with family or friends. In the evening, it could be taking a stroll during the nightly passeggiata. Italy is full of beautiful things. Paintings, sculptures, mosaics, well-dressed women and men, piazzas, fountains, 
hillside towns, seaside villages, and classic architecture. Bellissima! Beauty comes in many forms. The more you develop your aesthetic sense, the more you can begin to appreciate and cultivate the beauty around you. La vita è bella. And when you truly experience the beauty and joy that can be found in life's everyday moments, you'll be on your way to living la dolce vita. Let the journey begin. Buon viaggio. Ciao. Honoring space to me is my husband going to work an hour before me in the morning and him getting home an hour before me at night. So we each have that little bit of alone time. I was feeling isolated and we worked out where I could come back to the office two days a week. I have tried to take time for myself and at least one day on the weekend go for a walk by myself. It has helped immensely. Welcome to the second edition of Eat the Season. I'm your host, Heather Irwin, dining editor for the Press Democrat and founder of Bite Club Eats. As we round the corner into fall here in wine country, it's time for putting up or canning and jarring all of the best flavors of our harvest. Leslie Goodrich of Lala's Jam Bar and Urban Farm Stand here in Petaluma is the queen of cooking up seasonal, small batch preserves from fruits right here in Sonoma County like Petaluma apricot basil, Healdsburg peach, Petaluma strawberry raspberry, plum, and orange marmalade. Taught jam making by her Scottish grandmother, Leslie's first attempts at selling jam came in 2014, made right in her home kitchen and selling it from a card table in her front yard. Now, her highly sought after jams are sold throughout the county and beyond. We're here today at her commercial kitchen and retail store in Petaluma, where she sells her jam and teaches jam making. Leslie, what are we gonna make today? Well, we're gonna make strawberry jam, and I'm so glad oh, you asked because these strawberries are not cut in any way. Okay. We just took the stems off. Okay. And you're gonna weigh them on okay. the scale. Okay. It looks like we got three pounds. Three pounds. Three That's pounds. what we're going to use. Okay. Three and pounds you're of strawberries. Stick that right in there. Yes. Okay. What All happens right. if now? If I didn't have a mask on, I'd probably eat some, but I can't. No. Okay. We're going to put the rest of the ingredients in. Okay. Because this is just strawberries. We're going to take and do a one cup of sugar. <laughs> I'm going to get a big <laughs> scoop of sugar. There we go. And then I'm going to. Oh. We're going to put in. Lemon juice. One quarter cup. A one quarter cup. Okay. Great. So, what's next? All right. So, what we're going to do next, we're going to take that over to the stove. Mmm. Look at this. That looks good. Okay. Every Sunday from now until December 15th, I give a cooking class, Jam Making 101. You learn how to make jam, and uh -huh. you're going to put your hand up a little bit. Okay. Good. It's getting pretty thick and it's, it's bubbling. Getting thick. And take your spoon. Okay. Let's take the spoon like this. What do you think? You're getting close. What do you think? Does I it think it like still jam? needs a little more time. That's right. Okay. Because it's still dripping off the spoon. Right. You want it to kind of hold tight. All right. Ooh, take your mask good. down and okay. see if you like that. Okay. One of the things you want to do is you do definitely want to taste this jam. It's so good. Tastes that like strawberries. So good. And this is only one cup of sugar in here. We're gonna take these jars out of the Ooh. oven. Okay. They are very hot. Very hot. Hot, hot jars. Very hot. Through. So fill it. And to we're gonna fill it right to a quarter inch. Okay. Alright, so we got our Ooh, piping hot. And we're just gonna make one jar at a time. Okay, now we're going to do the little, air bubbles. Yes. Uh-huh. See, I'm getting good at this now. You are. Okay. Okay, we're going to take this and we're going to... It's all 
about small batch here in Sonoma County. It's it about is. doing things that are reflecting the flavors of Sonoma County. It's doing things not in an industrial way, but right. doing them in a really small, delicious, you know, way that really speaks to to the person who's receiving it. You can't get quality and a cheap price at the same time. No. It's really very right. difficult to do. If you have fruit in your backyard, use it. Right. You know, that's the thing. Just use it. And voila! Wonderful. And now you see that there's water on the, the top. Okay. So you want to take the water off because it'll okay. make a mark. Good. This is looking good. This is looking fantastic. And look how pretty it is. It is really and pretty. And it will get more brilliant, more red as it cools. As it cools off. Okay, so we're going to let this cool overnight. Yes. Well, that was so much fun. Oh, I'm, I'm so excited. Glad you enjoyed Thank it. you for teaching me how oh. to make my own jam. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for eating the season with us. Until next time, I'm Heather Irwin. Keep your forks close and your adventures tasty. At St. Joseph Health, we're here for you through it all with a world-class, compassionate care now or in the future, in person or virtually. We're always here for you. Find the care you need to get back to you at stjosonoma.org. Hi, I'm Dusky Estes of Black Pig Meat Co. and Farm to Pantry. And in the last Women in Conversation, we talked a little bit about having cocktails in my backyard. So we thought we'd do it this time. First, of course, is bacon. I'm putting bacon in today's cocktail. But so the first thing I'm gonna do is make bacon bourbon. So I'm putting the bacon in a pan and I'm gonna render its fat. And while the fat is rendering, which the fat is good, once all the fat is rendered out, you're gonna put bourbon in there and put it in your fridge. And then the fat, as it gets cold, will float through the bourbon to the top and flavor the bourbon with bacon. While that is rendering, I'm gonna get busy on making a little maple simple syrup, which is the easiest simple syrup in the world. If you just have warm water and a little maple syrup, so it's one part water to two parts maple syrup. And I'm just gonna mix it together by shaking it up. And that is my maple simple syrup, if you can believe it. And I can already smell the bacon. Too bad you can't smell it. It's delicious. You can get the smoke, the applewood smoke, a little sweet from the brown sugar. While this is rendering, I'm gonna get ready with my garnishes. So I'm gonna show you three different possible garnishes today. One is a bacon caramel popcorn that we make that is my favorite garnish of all. Salty, sweet, crunchy, all at the same time. Stab it with a toothpick, there's your garnish. So you can make your own caramel popcorn, you can get our caramel popcorn on blackpigmico.com, or we have a twizzle uh, stick of bacon, which basically I just spiraled my bacon, wrapped it in a paper towel, and put it in the microwave for a minute and this is what you get, a bacon swizzle. But so now this bacon is rendering all its fat and I'm gonna put, I'm gonna turn the heat off and I'm gonna add bourbon. Can you hear the sizzle? So we just add some bourbon and then this goes in my fridge overnight. And then I scrape the fat off and I'm left with uh, beautiful bacon bourbon and you can strain the bacon out. And so that's what I've done here, a little bacon bourbon. So now let's get to our cocktail, shall we? A little bit of ice in our glass. One ounce of bacon bourbon. One ounce of Madeira. An ounce and a half of our Maple Simple. And then a half a lime and a half a lemon. I have to say the citrus is one of the best parts of the drink, other than the bacon. My dogs and my chickens want to be a part of this with you all. Then we get to shake it up. This is my version of a cocktail shaker, a mason jar shaker. And so you could then be ready to serve either with this garnish or this garnish like this, or my favorite garnish. Takes a little bit of patience. There it goes. Get your smoke in there. 
And now you have your smoked bacon bourbon cocktail. So when you take the lid off, it's kind of impressive. And it smells really good, like bacon and applewood smoke. Totally refreshing. You're in the shot, it's your birthday. <laughs> so open it up and let the, the smoke out and take a little wow. sip. Woo! Cheers. Cheers, happy birthday. <laughs> wow, that's delicious. Have a good time, everybody. I am very excited to introduce our main segment on honoring space. We are exploring beautiful vignettes, indoor plant paradises, and the healing power of music. Let's discover how the experts behind these topics have survived and excelled during these times. Alicia Andriola is a prop stylist, art director, and expert in transforming a space. She turns life into art, chaos into calm, and stories into aspirations. She works from scratch to build a universe of the seen and unseen that engages the viewer's imagination. Alicia specializes in creating moments, taking small artifacts and creating beautiful and small vignettes. She's a firm believer that finding, creating, and enjoying beauty will help us get through these tough times. And that transformation of spaces doesn't have to affect the whole house. Even in a chaotic household, you can carve out a space that gives you joy, add a few special touches, and allow yourself to take in the magic and beauty of what you created. After over 20 years in the business, Alicia makes magic happen in any space. Coming off of that video watching you, Alicia, you may have the coolest job I've ever seen. How much fun is what you do. You have such a unique background. How did you get into this? How much fun is it? Hi, thanks. Oh God. I started years ago. I have, a, I come from a family of artists and creatives and we're all very creative and inventive and do all the things. And years ago I went to visit my brother who was living in New York and I was there for what I thought was two months. And in that time, he had a friend who needed an assistant. So my brother also is a stylist and art director. Okay. Um, and so he had a friend that needed an assistant and I started working and I loved it. And I went all over with this guy. We did all sorts of things. I learned so much and I ended up extending my stay. And I was in New York for almost a year, a little over a year, but being from here, Sonoma County, it was too hard for me. I was like, I missed like this area and this is my home. So I came back. I, I, I so relate to having to come back. I, I had done a couple of bouts to Los Angeles and back and I just had to, I had this gravitational pull to yeah. Sonoma County, had to come back. So explain for people who don't know what a, a prop style artist is. What is it? How do you get into that industry? So what it is, is I work with companies who need their images created. So I source, I, first I meet with whoever wants to hire. I source all the beautiful things for their visions, and then I make it come to life. So I work with a really amazing team of um, photographers and companies, and it's really a team effort, but what I bring to it is all the, the setup, so the beautiful things. And how to get into it, I don't, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Just happens. Did, did the connection with your brother, did that have anything to do with the path that you took? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. He is so instrumental in a lot of things in my life. He's two years older than me, but he taught me so much. And my mom and my grandma, like, we're all creative. And I thought, you know, I come from this long line of creative. If you're anything but a creative, it's confusing. So, like... No, you're, you're, you're not you're, what yeah know your role in your family for sure yeah and in my industry in television we always have interns when, when times are normal we're not a, in, in a pandemic I highly recommend getting an internship for people who ask how did you get into what you do if somebody asks you that for your profession what do you tell them I tell them to just ask questions. Do I, I actually love having interns. Um, I prefer to pay my interns um, because I think it's helpful. But a lot of it is just being there and learning. And 
a lot of my job is sourcing things from all over and a lot of it is not glamorous like my car is packed to the to the brim and then there's a tree on top so you know it's a lot of loading and unloading but i think just trying it and being on set and learning how to do it and just watch it i mean i always say i would say yes you know like not always but i say yes a lot so people ask like can you do this and i've never done it before but i can figure it out yes I love that. I, there's, there's power in both saying yes to things you don't know how to do and also having the power to say no when you know yeah. you want to do it. Exactly. I <laughs> so you have all these like cool tips and tricks for improving a home, but right now it's such a unique time. I'll use that word to try and stay positive during a pandemic with our fires. We have a lot of people living in transitional spaces. So if you're not sure you're gonna stay somewhere a long time, what are your suggestions for beautifying that space on a budget, not having to do too much? What, what do you suggest in that situation? I think we should look at it like we're not gonna be somewhere for a long time. I think that we should live in every space like this is where we're living right now and being in that moment is really important. So using all your beautiful things painting the wall a color even if you're just going to be there a month creating it so it's pretty to look at but that also goes without saying that like it's okay to have a pile somewhere you know it's okay to not not everything is gorgeous but like making it pretty for that moment and you really believe in using the good stuff will you expand on that philosophy yeah absolutely i love using the good stuff i mean I didn't honestly use the good stuff before COVID. I spent all the good stuff on my jobs and my clients. And I thought, oh my God, we're stuck. Here. Like we're here and this is it. So let's pull all that stuff out. I hung those beautiful string lights that I use for all the things and I never had them at my own house, but I hung those up. I put an outdoor bathtub in, which is gorgeous. And like, I just started using things, like use, pulling out the pottery and using it every day. We, we mentioned, we had a chance to catch up earlier about bringing out grandma's silver and taking the time to polish it and use it and enjoy it. Cause I know mine has sat in a cupboard for years and there's, it's special to me because it was hers, but I don't utilize it and I should. Yeah. I think that's so great. I got that. Really <laughs> I, got, I think anybody watching that's my friend is going to be like, well, did you get that silver out? Did you polish it yet? Yeah. So, <laughs> I just threw myself out there for, for sure. Let's talk a little bit more about your acceptance of having some chaos in your home. I know uh, you, you are able to find calm out of chaos. Plus, you have a teenager. Not to say that means chaos, but oftentimes it does. And you're sharing this space. So how do you navigate through that? How are you okay with some chaos in your home? I, I mean, honestly, I've always been okay with some chaos. I think I kind of thrive in the chaos and the uncomfortableness makes me like excel. Um, but now it's just kind of like what I said before, like giving up, like not giving up. Let me rephrase that. Like, just being in the moment, mm -hmm. like we're like, it's okay. It's, it's okay that there's like a pile of boxes of stuff. I got shipped here for a future job in my living room. Like this is gorgeous, but you know, and that's what I think I've learned too on my, with my job is like creating little areas that really make you happy. Um, and really like feel for you, even if there's a pile on the other side, like my friends are going to laugh at me because they know how chaotic things are. <laughs> So it's I think it's behind the curtain. Yeah. yeah, behind the curtain. But that's what a set life is like too. Like we're all looking at this one image and it's so gorgeous, but behind the scenes there's people and stuff and boxes. And, and so transferring that into my house is what I've learned in the last couple of months. It's so true. The, the set stage uh, comparison that you made as to what we look at on the stage versus what's behind the curtain because what's behind the curtain is more reality and that plays into our life we're not ever going to have everything be perfect and so I love that it's not giving up but maybe just accepting accepting that this is okay 
to, to totally. live like this and you I have a little more peace when, when you do that. So we saw in your video that you go to antique stores to source items. You know, what, what are you looking for in those situations, especially for people watching who are on a budget? What would be some suggestions that you could give them? Um, when I'm out shopping, I'm usually prepping for a specific job. So I find things for that job. But for me, I love, 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 love pottery. I love pottery. So I look for any beautiful shapes, um, anything that really like speaks to me. I think the biggest advice is just to follow what you actually like. Like it's not, it's not, it doesn't matter what's on, like what's an Instagram or whatever. It's like what you're drawn to and what you love is what makes you happy. So whatever that is, mine's, pottery and wood bowls. And I look for those all the time and I could never have enough. <laughs> you pick them up wherever you go. If you see them, you like it, you pick it up. Oh yeah. Yeah, I do. And it's a little bit of a problem sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can see how they could add up a little bit. At least bowls can stack. You can exactly. Stack. Yeah. They're be a beautiful stack. Mm -hmm. So you love bowls and pottery. You're looking for those when you go to antique stores. It, do you have a generalized list where people would come to you, there's, they say, Alicia, you're so good at making things beautiful. What are your five top tips uh, to help out a home? Is it collections? Is it, what, what would you put in that, in that list? I think, um, I think collections is huge. So like putting, like, the, like putting something together that makes sense. So all of, like if you have a ton of different, whatever it is, vases or baskets, if you gather them all together, it looks intentional. So that's a beautiful set. Um, another thing I do in my home is I open all the windows. I open all the blinds. I let the light in wherever it's coming from because um, that's super important. And, you know, cleaning the windows if you want, um, but just letting that air and that light come in. I think we spend so much time with that shut that now, and it's okay if the neighbors see you, open that up. Um, let's see, another tip I do is lighting. So if you, like in your kitchen, if you have an overhead light that's like the fluorescent ones, which tons of houses have, try not to use that when you're cooking at night. Maybe move in another lamp and it gives it a different feel. It feels like, it just feels different. Maybe it's a little bit more romantic or whatever, but it does feel different. Um, let's see, what else? What else do I do? Oh, I, you know, I take stuff off the floor. So even if it's in a basket, it just like lifts it up a little bit. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Cause that helps alleviate some of what looks like clutter and you can kind of just, I'm a big believer in doors on a, yeah. like in my house, like with furniture, with doors. So the clutter's behind the door, but you can't see it. I know it's, it's my, it's my curtain <laughs> on my stage, right? It's all in there in my own little chaotic mess, but I know it makes sense. Yeah. Lastly, I just, I love that you talk about letting the light in and we both have 15 year old sons. So I won't speak for your son, but I know my son's room is the darkest room in the house. It's like a dungeon. So what's your suggestion for parents of teenagers who love to have the dark room with all those lights around, you know, those little fluorescent lights? Um, should we open their blinds a few times a day to get them? Yes. <laughs> open the blinds. Okay. Open the window. Yeah. It's great. It feels when good. When goes, oh, it hurts. I shouldn't worry. Just do it. Just do it. It feels so much better. It, it really does. does. It does. It does. Well, it has been an absolute pleasure to speak with you and to learn from you. You are so amazing and inspiring. You have such a great energy. Thank you for doing this. And we're going to catch up to you at the end of the show when our whole panel gets together for a Q&A. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Eki Shola is a physician and musician that creates music to express her journey and provide a comforting, enlightening mental space for her listeners. After the unexpected passing of her mother and losing her home in the Tubbs fire, she was inspired to turn her passion for music into a full-time venture. Eki and her family barely escaped the fire, losing their house, instruments, 
home recording studio and three albums worth of recorded songs. Music has been a powerful force throughout her life, and she had found it to be healing for both herself and those around her. With everything going on in the world lately, music is her outlet to process the roller coaster. It helps her to embrace newness and self-discovery through the power of voice. What a pleasure to introduce Eki Shola to everybody. You have such a unique story of perseverance that we're going to get into today, but I do want to just backtrack to the fact that you're a physician and musician. I love that. So you're kind of this fantastic dual threat. And if you would just take us down your journey of how you went from physician to full-time musician. Right. Well, I think it all pretty much started when I was five. I always knew I wanted to be a doctor. Don't ask me where that came from, but uh, it was always there. I got my first doctor kid, later on had the Barbies, was always breaking them apart and then putting them back together. And it was sort of this straight shot uh, journey. You know, it, there's a formula really to you know get into medical school and hopefully you're successful on your first try. And so it was just, you know, A to B to C. And then, you know, I was practicing starting in 2010 after my, after my travels. And in 2011, um, I had my uh, second child and within two weeks, I was flying back to New York to be with my mom. I had a C-section, brought a little baby with me. And uh, in two weeks we found out my mom had cancer and it was a pretty rare and aggressive cancer and basically I ended up spending six months back and forth to be able to be with her and it was the most challenging time uh, that I've experienced but it was also the most beautiful mm. and really um, special time that I had with her and I remember saying January 2012 my siblings my father and I were all um, planning her memorial back in New York and it was just got stressful it was just I, was like, I can't take this anymore it's too much and we took a break went upstairs into my bedroom where I grew up and some of my old instruments were there and I found my keyboard my dad had his drums there my brother had his double bass and my sister or he had his guitar my sister had her violin and we just jammed like three hours or so and it was most, you know, cathartic experience ever. It was just incredible. And I remember after that saying, that's it, I have to do music. And the funny thing is, as a family, we're all, uh, we, we all play instruments, but we had never played together mm -hmm. as a family before. And so this time it just meant so much. Even mom was there in her, uh, ashes uh, form in the urn in the bedroom with us so she her spirit was there and yeah it was just um that was the, the moment i knew that i had to just do music so i don't want to project uh you you you're the expert on this but music seems to be its own source of medicine for a lot of people um what type of medicine do you practice do you still practice and how how did these professions play off of each other is there a medicinal aspect to music for you? Well, I find that, you know, mo both modalities potentially can be healing. Uh, that's how I see it. I trained in internal medicine and I sort of had a second pivotal moment in 2017, which made me sort of reassess where I wanted to be career-wise and what I wanted to do. However, I think it was about a few years prior to that, I switched over to working as an independent contractor, which allows me and has allowed me to have the flexibility to work wherever I choose, different clinical settings, whether it's from home or not. So I love having that flexibility where I can move between music and medicine. But they, I think they're very, uh, they're very linked. I mean, even in the UK, there was some legislation passed uh, recently, I believe, how now physicians can actually uh, write a prescription for music. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
you're, you were a little bit ahead of your time. You didn't even know it. Let's, let's chat a little bit of, about some other loss that you've had in your life besides the loss of your beloved mother, which is just, it's so difficult to lose a parent. Um, but you also lost your home in uh, the Tubbs fire. And a lot of people watching this, Eki, can relate to, to where you were. It was a devastating time and you were a victim of it. And yet somehow you used the pain and turned it into your own path and power. Can you share a little bit about how you were able to do that and how music played a role in this for you? I had one CD, one or two CDs left that were in the glove compartment of my car. Mm -hmm. And it was my favorite artist called uh, Bonobo. Mm -hmm. And ironically, the album cover is of a big bonfire flame. But I played that CD post wildfire every day um, on my commute. And where we lived, it was a very windy, narrow road. And I remember at the time when I was really grieving my mom, just feeling full of despair and having a really difficult time coping. And that road just felt so heavy and just so um, depressing. I remember just hitting rock bottom and, and saying to myself, I don't want to feel this way forever. I don't want to feel this way forever. And I remember listening to the radio. There was a piece on NPR. And there was a doctor talking about um, veterans and uh, who had PTSD, and he said for those who who made it through and, and were able to cope, it was because of the active choice they made in their life to move forward. And there's no, no amount of uh, advice or medication or anything that, that he could have given to them. It, it came from within. And, and I remember that. And I, so fast forward to the fires after the fires and driving that same narrow, twisty, winding road, I had so much more gratitude at the point um, because I had, you know, I made the decisions like I, I, I cannot go through and be back to where grief had taken me before. And then I realized I have a say in this. I, I have a say in my own healing. And that, you know, really propelled me. And I also had a different level of respect for that road because that road led us out of the fire. So, you know, it, it, it takes time and, and, and grief is not hard. I still grieve uh, every day, it feels like, but there's also, I found a gift from it. Mm -hmm. And I feel like my mother lives on through, you know, through my music and I feel that, you know, I'm able to honor her in that way. So I'm, I'm very, I feel very thankful for that. Well, and what's so interesting about you, too, is you have this long history with music of playing instruments. I know you grew up in London. We can still hear that beautiful accent that we all wish we had, uh, but we don't in California. We have this flat voice. And you have evolved as an adult mm -hmm. into singing. So what helped you make that leap to use your voice as your instrument as well? Right. Well, I had always played it was sort of on hiatus during medical school and residency training just because of no time and then it was in uh, 2015 i said to myself i want to play for i want to play out you know and i said okay i'm going to do an open mic before the year is over before 2015 and over and in december i did my first open mic at hot monk uh, tavern in sebastopol i was terrified and shaking and nervous and I just played and then got off the stage and then I was like hmm, you know maybe I should try again give it another shot and in early 2016 I started doing a few more open mics and at the time I was playing and composing pretty much all instrumentals and I had you know people come up to me at the end of the show and they're like do you sing oh why don't you sing and I'm like because I don't sing. They're like, you should, you should. I'm like, why? <laughs> so I brushed it off. But after hearing it quite a bit, I said, okay, maybe I can. But I still had, the playing was fine, but stage fright with singing is what got me. I've never really been a fan of my own voice. I was in choir in school, never really enjoyed it. 
And so I said, well, let me just take some group lessons. And I took some classes um, with uh, Denise Barron, and it was a group class. And I think I probably had the courage to sing close towards the end of that several month class. And what the premise was really was overcoming one's fear and one's inhibition, because we all have our own voice and we can all sing. And it was just being able to embrace that and feeling comfortable um, really in my own skin was what allowed me to start singing and then start writing lyrics and then singing them live. And it's just another instrument, and I, it, you know, it's another tool. So it, it really is a true instrument and you have the most beautiful voice. It is really such a gift to all of us. So I'm really glad that you decided to use it. Um, in your introduction, we use this phrase for you that you have been processing the roller coaster. And of course that roller coaster continues as you were also evacuated during the glass fire. And these past three years have been just tumultuous for so many Sonoma County residents uh, dealing with the fires. Mm -hmm. But you actually have a YouTube post-evacuation jam. Can you share a little bit about what that is? Uh, yeah, that was, we, I think we evacuated for about a week, a week in the East Bay and I was just getting itchy and antsy and like, I need something to play something. And so I came home and just let it out. And, uh, you know, I have it, there's I have a few sort of songs in my repertoire that are just, um, I don't know, almost medicinal. And so Alice Coltrane, Journey and Satin Denanda, if I'm pronouncing it right, is one of them. So I just did a little improv, of just making up stuff on the fly, my own music, and then did another video of just playing along with Alice Coltrane. And it just kind of, you know, brought the anxiety from here to just like, okay, we can do this. I love that. I love that. So last thing before I let you go, and I will catch up with you in the in the panel discussion. Yeah. We do have more time at home now than we ever have during quarantine, during a pandemic. Yeah. If anyone watching has been thinking about taking up an instrument, this might be a time to do that. Mm -hmm. What do you suggest for folks, whether it's an instrument or singing or some other artistic outlet. It doesn't necessarily have to be music, journaling, whatever it could be. Yeah. What are your suggestions for people who have been thinking about it and how they make that actual leap to doing it? Just do it. Like Nike. <laughs> the, Nike, <laughs> the Nike phrase. You know, you only live once and it's never too late. You know, a friend just sent me an email the other day. He's like, I've, I finally bought the keyboard that I, you know, been meaning to on Amazon. And he's got, you know, his uh, iPad with lessons on it. Pick, pick something. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about it. You can try different things, uh, you know. And it doesn't mean you have to go out and buy the biggest, you know, most expensive instrument either. You've got instruments in your house. I mean, if I could show you, I've got some rusted tin pans that I was able to, salvage from you know our home that burned i've got some um, hand percussion i filled a little jar of popcorn to make a little shaker yep so, yeah yeah so just play with it play with your voice i mean pretty much a lot of us most of us have phones and recording capability record the birds do a little duet with them Aww. just play a little, play snow white, a little snow white duet yeah <laughs> Hey, if not now, when, right? Eki Shola, you are a beautiful soul. Thank you so much for joining us and inspiring us. And I look forward to seeing you in the group discussion. Thank you. Lindsay Wallstrom transforms homes and businesses into thriving green spaces. 
she has renovated her Petaluma home into her dream jungle oasis where she lives with her husband and their two dogs, Lolo and Zeus. After years in a corporate career, she started a plant design side hustle during her free time. Feeling the joy plants brought her and others, she followed her passion and took her business full time in January. Lindsay takes pride in her designs and hand selects each plant for her clients. To her, a beautiful home is about finding pieces that make you happy. She knows firsthand the health benefits that plants bring and has found that caring for plants is rewarding and therapeutic. Well, it's a pleasure to meet you officially. Lindsay Wallstrom, you have such a, a cool gig. Your side hustle became a real hustle. You come from a corporate background, but now you're on your own dream journey, designing plants for yourself, for people, um, making homes beautiful with them. How did you come about making that change and why did you want to leave the hardcore corporate world and, and get into plant design? Yeah, so actually I started working for a corporate headquarters in Petaluma and I loved my job. I loved what I was doing. Um, after a couple years, the headquarters actually decided to move to San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So it took, you know, I had a five minute commute turned into what could be two hours each way. And that time actually really gave me the the extra time to think about what do I really want to do? What, what truly brings me joy? And that is plants. And how could I take these plants and be able to spread that joy to others? So I started um, Leaf and Lolo, actually, it, all those hours of commuting, um, you know, I would think about the business plan and how it would evolve. And so I started while I was working, still in a corporate environment, and just decided to take the leap in January to do this full time. Mm -hmm. Which I, it leads me to my next uh, question for you because it was this year, which I think we can all agree 2020 has kind of been the pits in general, but you started a new career in 2020. How has the pandemic affected this dream journey that you decided to take and how have you had to pivot around quarantine and maybe not being able to go into people's homes as much? So. 2020 has definitely taught me to pivot and kind of be able to shift and not know what to expect next. So while it has been a journey, it's also led to a ton of growth just, you know, from within and also adding on layers of the business I never uh, anticipated. So because I used to spend a lot of my time um, going into people's homes and businesses and bringing plants into their space, in the beginning of COVID, that was not an option. Um, so I was thinking about ways that I could still bring the joy of plants to people and decided to roll out a curbside delivery service. So it brought me joy to see, I get pictures from clients who show me how much growth they've, their plants have experienced just over the past several months. And it just makes me so happy to see. You've touched a little bit about, on a little bit about what you do, but I want to know the reaction you get when people say, oh, Lindsay, what do you do? and you say, oh, I'm a plant stylist and coach, do, do they know what that is? What do you tell them? Um, so a lot of people don't know what it is and, and are surprised that that can be a job. So um, it's funny because, you know, maybe 10 years ago, I didn't realize that, that it could be a job. And so I think um, a lot of what I do is, you know, what might be intuitive to me as far as bringing plants into a space in a way that they'll really thrive and match somebody's lifestyle is not intuitive to everyone. So I really offer that service for people who want an inviting green space, but don't know how to get there. Um, and then I also leave them with a plant care guide. So it's not just a plant that's gonna last a couple of months. It's, it will show you how to truly take care of them. You also have said that you believe plants lead to productivity. How? So there have been studies done to show that um, plants do increase productivity. Um, but how, why I find them um, beneficial in your workspace and throughout the house is just, to me, I believe they offer just um, serenity and they're relaxing. So when I'm spending time with my plants, whether it's watering them or aerating the soil, wiping down the leaves, whatever it is, I am really focusing on another form of life and growth and it allows me to just be in the moment. So 
So they do offer productivity in my mind, but also just a, just a calming sense as well. What is your advice to folks when we were able to see your video, you, your wall of plants is so gorgeous and it's so picturesque. It's, it's perfection. It's very HGTV, as you know, my daughter is like super into these. I mentioned her to you the other day when we had a chance to chat, but for people who get overwhelmed by the time it takes to care for the plants. So do you suggest less plants? Do you suggest more hardy plants that don't need as much water? Like, where do you go with people's anxiety in the time it takes to keep them alive? Because I think a lot of people watching aren't good at keeping plants alive. And hi, I'm not great at it. So I would suggest starting out small. Don't go out and get 10 plants, but start with one or two, and once you've sort of felt like confident that you can keep them alive, that's when you can start to bring more into your space. But the plant, there are plants out there um, that are a little bit hardier. I mean, all plants require light and water to truly thrive, but plants such as snake plants, um, pothos, and spider plants are a little bit more tolerant of uh, maybe infrequent watering, <laughs> infrequent watering or lower light conditions. Yeah. So those are the plants I would suggest if you want to start out on your plant journey. I love that. So I had mentioned to Alicia, my 15-year-old son, in the dark room, maybe, maybe I need a spider plant for sure. That's hardy. Oh, my goodness. And I have to ask because, I mean, personally for me, what I found with um, the home schooling situation for everybody right now, our daughter is 12 and she wanted a new room design she's getting a little bit older her room was a little childish but really it came down to Lindsay. she wanted a cool zoom background and it was very specific i mentioned it to you floating shelves with succulents so what are your suggestions because kids can't go to school right now and show off their new school clothes and you know have this this fashion uh discussion with their friends and so it's become their sets are are what they're talking about and doing things to their Zoom sets. What are good suggestions for preteens, teens, and Zoom backgrounds? Um, so I actually would suggest a potho. So that's this plant back here. And what I love about them, um, they're, they're great on a shelf. And as you can see, they trail. But also, you can begin to train them to grow along the wall. And it's just beautiful. And what I love is when given proper light requirements, these plants grow really quickly. So it would be super fun in the beginning of the school year now to take a photo of you with your background, with your plant, and then at the end of the school year, take another photo and see how much growth um, you both experienced. Oh, I love that. Okay, we'll have to get one of those for Gracie's room for sure. Um, you're looking at your Zoom set and, and seeing the video of your home, uh, you really have, it seems like Alicia and you work together on prop styling and it just comes across as a simple, clean look. How would you describe your home style? Um, so I would say I'm inspired by like the California casual vibe. Um, there's a touch of Bohemian. Obviously it's a bit of a jungle, but what really um, I find calming is just neutrals and textures and they just give me that sort of serene environment and allow the plants to really shine as well. Mm -hmm. oh, I love that and I know you have two dogs so are there you know we always talk about things that are um, you know not not to have in your home for kids or around pets is that a, a similar situation with plants are there plants that are more pet friendly or can handle if a pet gets a hold of it? Um, definitely. So I always suggest to look into plant, whatever you're bringing into your home plant-wise, do your research. Um, actually, a lot of plants are toxic to both pets and humans. So um, do your research. But some of my favorite plants that are pet-friendly are um, a ponytail palm and then also the spider plant. Ponytail palm and spider plant. Okay, those are good suggestions. And then if people watching are saying, hey, I want Lindsay to help me with this wall that I have. Like I have no plants behind me right now, right? Um, how, how are you doing that? How are you conducting your business? I know you mentioned curbside, but do you Zoom and look at their house that way? Yeah, so I also offer Zoom virtual services. So we'll assess the space and the light source and so which way are your windows, um, which way is the light coming in, which way are the windows facing? Because um, that has a lot to do with 
the happiness of your plants and the sort of light they're receiving. So I'll do that and then we will connect on, um, you know, I'll drop a mood board and we go from there and just start to install plants in their space. It's, it's really, it's its own art. It's really, really okay. interesting. The last one I'm going to ask you before we let you go and go into the panel discussion. You know, we mentioned plants that are hardy for those of us that aren't great and happened to forget that we have plants in our home. What about those that are pretty proficient with their green thumb? Are there plants worth kind of going the extra mile because of what they'll produce for you or what they'll look like or how they'll flower, whatever that may be. What, what plants do you suggest for those that are a little better with their green thumb? Um, I would suggest anything variegated. So variegated plants are usually plants that are mixed with green and then a bit of white or even a bit of pink. Um, these plants are rare, but also a bit more to take care of, whether it's the light or the humidity. So I would suggest anything variegated. Okay. All right. Well, it was really, really interesting to speak to you. I love that you decided to make this a job and you've shown people that you can follow your passion and turn it into your career. So that's, that's so inspiring in and of itself and you make beautiful things. And we'll see you in the panel discussion. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Amy. Well, I hope everyone watching has enjoyed getting to know our panelists as much as I have. I feel like it's just such a gift to meet all of you and hear your inspiring stories of whether you decided to follow your passion, how you find beauty in the chaos, Alicia and Eki, your true perseverance as a beautiful human being. They all just mean so much to all of us right now. We need this in our lives. So, Thank you for doing this. And we're going to do a fairly quick Q&A with all of you. And I think let's start, Alicia, with you. It's a big question, but who do you feel has most influenced you and why? I think, oh, wow, it is a big question. My, <laughs> <laughs> my biggest influence, honestly, are, are my, it's my family, first and foremost, obviously. Um, but I think it's people who are actually doing things. So like when Eki was talking, like that influences me. And when Lindsay was telling me things, like I, I get influenced by people who are, and you too, Amy, like passionate about what they do and actually do it. That's the biggest inspiration for me. I love that. Eki, we know how moved you are by music and how you've used it to heal and inspire. But when it comes to human beings, who has most influenced you? I'd have to say my mother. Um, she just had this silent strength uh, that I can appreciate that much more uh, being a mother to myself. Mm. And, you know, she grew up in Jamaica, immigrated to London and later to New York and raised the three of us, worked several jobs at a time while completing graduate school to get her a master's in social work. And all along encouraged and nurtured music uh, for the three of us. And she herself was also a musician. So I, yeah, she, she keeps on inspiring. Yeah. Well, and I know that she's not here for us to meet, but I feel like we kind of get to meet her a little bit through you. So thank you. Yeah. Lindsay, this is, a, this is an important question for all of you, I think. So I am going to have it. Uh, put out to all of you who has most influenced you and why um so again my my mom and my grandma have been huge um influences in my life both really strong amazing women um uh professionally designer justina blakeney is has always been an inspiration of mine the way that she continues to evolve her business um so i find a ton of inspiration with her as well i love that Lindsay. let's stay with you in today's climate What's something you try to avoid professionally or personally or both? Um, I would have to say negativity. I try to avoid it at all costs, both pro professionally and um, personally. Um, yeah, I, I feel like, you know, you kind of have a gut feeling um, and I just try to go with that. If something's not feeling right, I try my best to avo avoid 
anything having to do with negative energy. Yep. Which your plants give you all the positive energy. You're exactly. I love that. Alicia, how about you? Something you try and avoid in today's climate, professionally and personally? Um, I try to avoid the, the, the desperation that I felt a lot of times before, like the need to get everything and get it all done and the pressure and the driving and the commuting. I try to avoid feeling, feeling that pressure. It's hard. It's a practice, but, um, I think it's important. Like I take a little bit longer on the phone if I'm talking to customer service and I like it, that has been what I've done differently for sure. You know? Finding your patience. You yeah. Know, like, yeah. I'm, I'm on a shortage of that at times. <laughs> I wish I could avoid social media. Unfortunately, I can't because of my job. But that's one area where I'm like, hmm, things were different before social media. Eki, let's go to you. Your best advice for somebody wanting to make a life change. You, you've done many of those and had to pivot many different ways. And what would you offer up to somebody who was in a situation that they needed to make a life change? I think sometimes we can get stuck in, we used to call, there was a term in medical school training, analysis paralysis. And so you're just looping around, creating you know, the pros and cons and why you shouldn't, shouldn't do things. And you can kind of get stuck in that mode. And there's nothing like, and this sounds cliche, there's nothing like a fire to <laughs> lit underneath you, literally, to make you pursue that change. And so sometimes you just have to, you just have to do it. Well, and I think the, my favorite thing that you said was how you viewed that road to your house yeah. at first, and then you were able to switch it right. and view it as the road that led you to safety. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that. Lindsay, for you, making this big leap from the corporate world to following your passion and your love of plants and, and the joy that they bring you and that you knew they could bring other people, if you take that as a capsule and look at, hey, you pivoted your career and developed a career, what's your advice to somebody who's on the brink and they're like, I really want to do this, but... I'm so grounded in my career with the corporate world. It provides my benefits. It's, you know, all of the things that we hold on to and we think are important mm -hmm. instead of following what we want to do. What would you say? So um, much like Aki said earlier, just do it because you can always come up with reasons why not. Um, there is, you know, I understand people wanting to wait until they have their whole business plan, but just start and mm -hmm it will continue to evolve over time. Even if you had everything written out, things will change, um, your business will evolve. So just get started is my best advice. I love that, I love that. Alicia, for you, you know, you seem to have found your, your path early on in being able to see the beauty, especially, you know, in antique stores and, and there's that old cliche that, you know, you can find the best treasure in a in a pile of trash or whatever it is, but what do you suggest to people who want to make a change in their home, but they, they aren't quite sure how to go about it. They're not sure how to put collections together. They're not sure how to make sense of some kind of design. And so like Eki said, there's paralysis by analysis. They don't do it. They leave their house the way it is and, and they kind of live in this rut. So what do you say, how do you push people to, to make that leap? Uh, to shake it up and to do that. Um, I think just practice like the first thing, like when you're sitting in your house and you're sitting at your dinner table, like look around, maybe move stuff around. It's not, it's, it's not as intimidating as it seems. It's really just try, just trying to move, move the, move the energy around and move things around. And um, I think that's the, that's the biggest advice and not to be worried about it, you know, not to, not to worry about any of the outcome, not be connected, but try to change it up. Just, I mean, I know that's kind of vague because it's, it does come so easy for me. So I realize that, but I think it's just trying it out. Trying well, it. Trigger to move things around. How would this look over here? Opening the blinds, yeah. right? It's like, how does it look with more light? Yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. But I, and it's interesting that people really are afraid to change their style, you know, because it, it, 
characterizes them in a sense. It defines them often and, and we have to evolve. So it'd be fun to do it with what we have in our home. I love that. So kind of a large question, um, but I'm big on being real. And, uh, you know, we present these three panelists to everyone watching and obviously we all look at you and say, oh, I wish I was like that. I wish I could see things that way. I wish I could, you know, get collections like Alicia and Lindsay has this fantastic eye for plants and Eki's this fabulous musician and you are all amazing, but you're also all human and you have days that maybe you don't want to wipe the leaves off the plants, Lindsay and Alicia. You don't want to go search for that treasure. And Eki, maybe you don't feel like singing. I just wanted you guys to each kind of convey to the audience that human side and how you deal with days like that. And let's, Eki, let's start with you. Oh, yeah. There are times I don't want to practice. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not going to force it because if I do, it will sound like crap. Uh, so, yeah, you have to have, you, it, look, it's okay to feel your feelings, all of them. Um, I think then it's like, how do you move from that, right? But one thing, I'll tell you this, one thing that has helped me personally is meditation and i've always heard it you know it helped it's helpful so on and so forth but i never really fully believed it but developing a practice and trying it even if it's just for a few minutes a day has um, been incredibly helpful just to kind of you know get yourself centered to turn off those wasteful thoughts that yes i do get you know and just to give you that rejuvenation and energy to keep trying and, and changing because you know, it, in this business, there, there's no A to B, there's no black or white, uh, there's no magic pathway, and it's, you know, you have to adjust, and so I find that meditation helps to kind of reset yeah. all of that and to help me to stay hopeful. Yeah. Alicia, I, I don't know if this happens to you. I know I already said it to you, but I get told this a lot, like, oh, you have such a cool job. Is every day just so much fun to go yeah. to the ballpark and cover this team and I'm thinking did you see the loss last night do you know I have to go talk to 20 something year olds who just lost so bad they don't <laughs> speak at all and they're having their own little temper tantrum do you have days where it's not as glamorous as it seems to be on the set and to have to design and how do you oh, get through those absolutely I mean a lot of times like I said before it's like my car is full of stuff <laughs> I've eaten like a handful of almonds. I'm like jacked on iced coffee and I, and it's still 9 PM and I'm in the city. So yeah, there are like days where I'm just check out. Yeah. Um, and that's a huge reality of, of my job. Um, but I also to, to, to get out of that, I just let like, I just let it go. I yeah. let it, I let it go. I let it go. And, and to not, not be so hung up on it, you know, I just like, okay, this is it, moving on. And I also, like I said before, have an amazing team that really supports me, and that's huge too. Even my son, I'll get home at 10 p.m. from shooting all day, and he's like, can I help you unload your car? That's the best. Is that yeah. not the best I know when they're 15 and they all, like my son will be like, can I help you with the groceries? I'm like, yes, you can. <laughs> I guess you can. Um, and I love the almonds reference. I always have a bag of almonds in my car because I'm always starving. I don't have time to eat. Lindsay, for you, do you have days where you have designers block that you can't envision what you want to do for a client? How do you push through those? Absolutely. And I think it's a matter of just not forcing it um, because really your work will show when, when you're creative juices aren't flowing and you try to force it, that's when I feel like you can see it in your work. So I try to just allow that, fill that time in to my design process so that I, in case I end up having, you know, a creative block, I've just allowed myself the time to allow that to happen and not force anything. Okay, I love all of those answers. Last one, rapid fire. I know I need to wrap this up, but I could talk to you all forever. Quickly, your COVID, go-to food and drink. Lindsay, let's start with you. 
Uh, food, Trader Joe's rice cracker medley. So good. Uh, drink would be kombucha. You're healthy. I thought you were going to give me like some chocolate and wine. Eki, what do you got? Oh gosh. Well, it was peanut butter chocolate chip cookies, but I'm now doing a 21 day vegan challenge. So who knows? Who knows? Who knows? What's your COVID go-to drink? What, what, what do you have during COVID? Oh, uh, coffee. Coffee. Gotta be coffee. Yeah. yeah. All right, Alicia, <laughs> you get to get us out with a bang. You're going okay. to COVID. My go-to probably is dark chocolate. And then for drink, I've been drinking these like fancy elixirs, life-changing juice things that are like spicy and delicious. And I love those and they're a million dollars, but I love them from like the Nectary in Sebastopol is amazing with these like shots of something that changes my life. Oh, <laughs> or something. Something like that. Well, you have all changed many lives with your time this evening and I'm just so grateful and been very inspired to meet you all and have a chance to interview you. It's been a, a true honor. Thank you for joining us. And thank you to everyone who has been watching our second installment of Women in Conversation. We are grateful that you joined us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Dawn Ross. I'm a member of the Board of Directors at Summit State Bank. Thank you for joining us for the second segment of Women in Conversation at Home. We're pleased to continue our partnership with the Press Democrat as presenting sponsor of the Women in Conversation speaker series. Please remember to tune in for our next show on November 19th and register at SoCoWomenEvents.com for the details. Thank you to our series host, Amy Gutierrez, an inspiring local woman herself. We're proud to have her lead this program. We hope this evening has brought you joy, beauty, and laughter. These are extraordinary times, but we are resilient and we stand strong together. Thank you.